now we move to the next uh, inward transformational experience talk. Morning we heard about, you know, chartered accountants not getting into entrepreneurship. Well, we have with us a guy who had gotten bitten by the entrepreneurship bug. I request CA Praveen Shetter, EC member, CA Sujata S, KSCA member to escort CA Vivekananda Halakere onto the dais and welcome him with a book. Vivekananda is the CEO and co-founder of the very famous Bounce, India's first smart mobility solution. Being a CA by qualification, Vivek's venture into the world of entrepreneurship stemmed from his passions for bikes coupled with his love for numbers. Together with his co-founders, Vivek started Wicked Ride in 2014 and finally set up Bounce in 2016. At Bounce, Vivek handles business management, marketing and sales and also manages Bounce's investor relationships. Over to you, sir. Um, Namaskara. Uh, my name is Vivek. Uh, I'm a chartered accountant too. Um, I used to be with KPMG for a year. Then um, I quit, started my practice. Then I started uh, a startup called Bounce. Uh, started about four years ago. Uh, now it's almost six years, I guess. We started in the year 2014. Uh, with a simple idea that uh, why should people buy their own motorcycles? At least we started with the luxury motorcycles bit. The, we started with a brand and company called Wicked Ride. The idea was that you don't have to actually own a motorcycle if you want to uh, use one. You pay only for the time and distance you use. And we built a peer-to-peer -peer rental model. Uh, so this is what we started with, and it was one of the ideas that we had in a list, uh, list of ideas that we, were, we had in the Excel sheet. Uh, we just started with one motorcycle, uh, took a personal loan. Uh, took a personal loan from uh, HDFC Bank and uh, started with a Facebook page. So, uh, but during the journey, we figured that uh, luxury motorcycle rental business is not, not a large enough business, and we wanted to do something uh, which can actually be a large, large business by itself. So we, started, we were actually thinking what, what to do, and kind of we navigated towards mobility segment. So today, what we, what we have built uh, uh, over the last two years now is that we have built a mobility solution called Bounce. Um, which is a shared scooter system. A user should be able to, can actually open the app, find the nearest scooter, book the scooter, uh, access the scooter, pay, on, pay for the only time and distance he uses it. The idea was pretty simple um, on uh, uh, that, that if you want to attack a large problem, uh, we felt mobility is a real problem, which, will, which, will, which, will, which is going to be a 100, 100 year plus problem, right? As in, the problem keeps changing, but the mobility problem is for real. And in India, uh, what we figured was that only 18% of Indians have access to personal mobility. The rest depend on public transport or broken modes of commute. And I think you all know that uh, public transport uh, hasn't scaled in most of the cities in India. So that was the inspiration for us to uh, start working on commute. And uh, we actually looked at uh, what was happening across the globe. Uh, uh, across the globe, there were uh, in China, there were cy cycle sharing startups, but it was not on a dockless model. Uh, so uh, we were working with government of India on cycle sharing projects in India, but we figured that cycles can, cannot actually scale in India. That's when we thought, what, can, what else can scale? We started seeing scooters outside. And India, as you know, has more than 150 million plus two-wheelers on the road. And uh, India buys about 25 million plus two-wheelers year on year. So we thought, OK, why not we uh, take a scooter, which is already pretty famous, and people know how to use it? Why don't we just make it keyless? So what we have done is we have taken a scooter. There's no key in the scooter. It's all controlled by the app. And uh, users can pick up anywhere and drop anywhere. Uh, uh, so this is a solution that we've built. Um, so I want to quickly take you through um, uh, how, the, how the journey has been. Um, uh, they said personal transformation and everything. But what I can actually share today is uh, uh, how the journey has been, uh, what, what have been the guiding principles for us in uh, doing something, uh, uh, which, which today uh, does close to about 3.2 million rights a month in Bangalore, and uh, about close to about, um, close to about half a million rights in uh, Hyderabad month on month. So today, uh, Bangalore uh, is treated as a shared capital, uh, world's largest shared mobility uh, city as such. So this is the journey that we have gone through. But I'll just tell you what, 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 what all challenges we faced uh, when we were pitching this idea, uh, what kept us going, and how, how we have reached here today. Um, so I don't know how to change the slide. So this is, this is something that uh, my, my mom always used to tell me, that stop not until you succeed. I think also CA taught me this pretty well. Uh, uh, failing a lot of times. <laughs> so, uh, 
I think uh, it's, it's uh, very interesting, right? Uh, most of the courses, uh, people see uh, uh, failures in a very different way. Uh, I still remember the first time I failed uh, in my P2. I, I was disheartened. I, I thought that, okay, uh, what am I going to do in life? I still remember the, uh, the number of hours I cried after coming back from, after writing costing paper. Uh, uh, but I was like, and also I gave up, as in what I did uh, during my first attempt was that I came back, I said, okay, I'm not going to clear costing, um, so I'll just not um, uh, uh, write the rest of the exams, but I generally went and wrote, and I think that's, that's a uh, mess up that I did. I passed in all the subjects but for costing. At least I could have got some exemptions or whatever, but realized that you got to go in and not worry too much about the result and do it. And also what I realized writing CA exam is it doesn't matter how well you're prepared, uh, CA Institute knows how to set everyone, uh, level them up, right? So uh, I think when you don't take the exam very seriously and just get involved in what you're learning, that's when you clear. I think the attempt which I cleared was the attempt when, when I was uh, really relaxed and not worried too much about uh, 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 basically uh, the exams and everything. But you know, right, uh, being, I think most of us uh, would have gone through the experience, right? So, but I think what it taught me uh, is that it's okay to fail, uh, nothing to be ashamed of, and the whole world will be, most of them don't even know uh, what, what it is to be a chartered accountant, right? They'll be asking you which college do you go to everything, right? So you can't even explain to them, and they don't understand what it means to fail in CA. Uh, so this, this in, in a way, is your uh, real life preparation is what I, I feel. This is how real life also is, right? You, you're doing some startup which nobody understands. They'll have some thousand uh, uh, stories on why it can't work, uh, to everything, right? So I, 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 I think CA prepped me up for that. And again, uh, I think an, uh, another great experience uh, 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 being, uh, being a chartered accountant was, uh, so I see uh, CA as a generalist, though we are specialists for tax and other things, because we get to see a lot of businesses and uh, what, how each of the businesses are working, what is working out for, well for them to everything. I think you get a broad horizon of things. You understand, um, uh, basically, we, we are very good generalists. As in, if you want to start any business, you will know what are the things which will fail what to do, what not to do in a way. Probably we don't use it in day-to-day -day life, but for me, uh, as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur, I think the first thing I did when uh, we were pitching to VCs and everything was had a very good unit economics. Those days, uh, when we raised our first round in 2018, uh, the funding scene was still good, and nobody was asking about unit economics, but the clarity that we had on unit economics was very good, saying that how will we get into um, uh, this business and what will the unit economics look like and everything. So I think the, uh, the three years of experience that we get in CA firm is, is valuable. I think uh, the CA Institute doesn't sell it well. Uh, I think if the CA Institute sells it well, we should make uh, even MBAs and others get into the same program of articleship, which gives them a great exposure. Because what I've seen is uh, uh, the best of the, so today, uh, I still remember, so when, when we were trying to raise money from Axel and Sequoia, uh, Axel and Sequoia road closed about uh, uh, $9.2 million uh, for our first round of funding. Before that, there was a lot of struggle, but uh, I still remember the months we could not pay salary on time. We were very transparent with the employees. So we went through a hard time there. But when, when we got the money from, uh, when, we were, when we were pitching to Axel and Sequoia as such, the biggest question they had was, um, uh, you're, not, you're not a pedigree founder. So they use this word pedigree, though they don't say it out loud most of the times. They, they usually look for a pedigree founder. Uh, what they mean by pedigree is, uh, you should be an engineer. You should be probably from IIT or any of the Harvards and Stanfords. Uh, or you should at least be an MBA from IIMS. So that is pedigree for them. And uh, uh, they were like, okay, you don't, you're not a pedigree, so how will, you, how will you guys be able to do? Because two of our founders are, I'm, I'm a chartered accountant, my other founder is company secretary and our CWA. The third founder is an engineer. Third founder, um, though he has studied in great universities and everything, but still, uh, we were not the pedigree. So I still remember the kind of uh, struggle we, and this is something that you can't quantify to them saying that, okay, we'll pull it off, right? Though we were the best in the industry, we had, we had a lot of uh, understanding about the industry. This, this took us some time. But I think Sequoia was, uh, Sequoia is very bullish. Sequoia went ahead and uh, uh, Sequoia and Axel uh, did the round for us. But I still remember they were saying that, okay, it's a non-tech founder, non-tech CEO, will he be able to pull off to everything? Today, I think we have proved a lot. And I think this, is, this also happened only because of the kind of um, uh, uh, three months, uh, so the three years experience that we have working uh, in a, most of the times it works out when you work with a mid-sized firm, right? Because in a mid-sized firm, you get much more wider experience. So uh, C has helped me a lot. Um, I'll quickly glance through the slides that I uh, have. So uh, one thing which has worked really well for us is uh, thinking really big. So idea was that 
mobility should be seen as a fundamental right. Today, millions of uh, people don't have access to fundamental right of mobility. So we said, okay, we should, we should be able to serve to the millions. That's, that's the uh, idea that we started with, saying that, okay, we won't just be a wicked ride motorcycle rental company, which was cash rich, and do what we were doing. We'll take a bet. Uh, it's okay to see what happens, and we, we thought big. Uh, uh, I think it, it, it has played out really well. Uh, and staying fearless also has helped, because uh, we were the first company, uh, uh, definitely in India and even uh, across the globe, I think we are the only uh, dockless scooter sharing company today. There might be Bird and Lime, which do it on kick scooter. Uh, but the model that we put out in India, when the whole of world says that India, even the uh, uh, small tumbler that in a, rail, in a train, you have to chain it up, right, so that people don't steal, uh, we had this courage and uh, the idea saying that, okay, you can put the scooters out there. The only thing we did was we said, okay, we'll back it up in terms of unit economics saying that what will be the loss because of vandalism and theft, and we did not say that, okay, we'll just be worried that you can't put the scooters out there. Uh, today, uh, one of our city, Hyderabad, is profitable. Uh, I don't think anyone thought that uh, mobility companies can be profitable so quickly. It's been four months since the launch of Hyderabad city for us. Uh, we make almost a rupee per kilometer there. So uh, uh, it's, it's a, a great achievement that we have done internally. And uh, we are very happy that uh, when, when people tell us that uh, in India, this kind of solutions won't work, people will steal the scooter, people will steal the helmet, we said, yes, they will all do that. But the percentage of people who do that will be really small as compared to the general set of people who will really use the solution really well. So uh, today we get uh, thousands of helmets back because uh, the good folks recover the helmets from a common man and they send it back to us. So we always felt that the 99.99% of the people are good and they want companies like us to succeed and 0.01% probably want to, and here in, uh, in India it is not sadistic pleasure that they want to get, right? It's, it's more in terms of, of someone who's stealing a fuel, he wants to, he wants to feed himself. So, uh, it, he's doing it for uh, his livelihood and not for sadistic pleasure. If you talk about OFO in Australia, the biggest challenge they had was uh, uh, people were taking industrial uh, um, um, uh, uh, chopping machines to chop off cycles. So that was for sadistic pleasure. So in our thesis in India was that people will do it for the value in the product, not for sadistic pleasure, uh, which played out uh, pretty much uh, right for us in the thesis. Uh, thinking big also, uh, after our journey, what we started figuring was that Today we have 20,000 scooters in Bangalore. Uh, we have another uh, uh, close to about 5,000 scooters in Hyderabad. We felt with all of this uh, journey, right, we are still not very significant. Bangalore has close to about 7 million personal two-wheelers. India has close to about 150 million two-wheelers. So how can we be a large enough platform where we can really make an impact was the thinking which, which got us to do another thing that we recently started. So we figured that unless we have a million scooters on the platform, uh, nothing much, we don't make a dent in, in lives of people as such. So what we, what we figured was, uh, if you have to put a million scooters out there, it's a billion dollar debt. And if I have to get a billion dollar debt, it, I need a couple of billions of equity. And all of this will take at least three to four years, even if we are very aggressive, right? So we figured uh, that uh, there's another way uh, that we can leverage this in India. So we started something called as a Kirana model. What we did was we went to smaller cities, like Hassan, Belgaum, uh, Hubli, Darwat kind of cities. We go to the smaller cities, partner with about 200 local business owners. We initially see 2,000 scooters to them. Here, the model is not dockless. You can't pick up anywhere and drop anywhere, but you can pick up in one business store and you can drop it in another Kirana store. So this we started uh, about 90 days back. We have done close to about 100,000 rights already. The idea is that we seed our vehicles and start, but we enable um, uh, anyone to fund uh, scooters to these Kirana guys. So 250,000 Kiranas uh, buying four scooters will give us a million scooter. And it's scalable, it's doable. So uh, also what worked out in smaller cities for us is that um, the average distance uh, in the smaller cities, where almost 4x of what we see in Bangalore. In Bangalore, we see an average distance of 5 kilometers per ride. In smaller cities, we start seeing about 18 to 20 kilometers per ride because people were doing a lot of intercity uh, journey. So, uh, uh, real India is something that we have been able to solve. So, uh, these are the things which have played out uh, really well for us uh, in terms of thinking big and staying fearless. Uh, next. So uh, I still remember uh, when, when, when we were in this journey and uh, when people were not able to understand what is dockless uh, scooter solution, why. So I still remember Sekai used to ask us, uh, why is no one in China or US doing this? Uh, this was in 2016 when we were pitching this. Um, uh, so I, we really had a hard time explaining why no one in Europe or China or US were doing this. Uh, China had cycle sharing programs which were government driven uh, in 2016. OFO got their series in 2017, end of 2017. So we really, really did not have uh, uh, examples of great companies which have succeeded in dockless scooter sharing, while most of the Indian companies were, whatever were getting funded, were some, most of the times was a Western replica being implemented in India. Uh, 
uh, one thing which got us going was uh, Google, right? Google, uh, at least for Google, they had a different problem. Google was the, probably the 32nd search, comp search engine company. And uh, if they had started saying that, okay, if, if they had not done uh, what they did today, um, uh, Google wouldn't have been there. Google has been one of the massively uh, uh, tech-driven companies which has done a lot of things. Uh, if Google had thought through saying that, okay, there are 32 search engine companies and uh, why should we do it, the solution would have never existed. The question that we used to get from VCs were, why can't uh, Ola and Uber do this? Or uh, Ola has a lot of, uh, Uber then had a lot of capital, so uh, Uber can, can really do whatever you're talking about. So we were always asked, why, why is that you guys will succeed and why, will, why can't just Uber or Ola do this? But we went ahead doing, uh, so Google has been an inspiration for us, saying that it's okay if there are a lot of folks who can do this or who, who has a lot of capital, you can still go ahead and do what you want to do. Uh, I still remember the story which my mother used to tell me uh, about Alexander the Great. Uh, uh, this is more about the pedigree that investors usually ask, saying that you're not an IIT guy, you're not an IM guy, how will you really play it out? So this story is pretty simple. Alexander was uh, pretty young, I guess he was four or five years old. Uh, in his courtyard, uh, there used to be a priest uh, who used to come and see the palm and say that whether you are going to be a great uh, king or not. So this priest, one of these days, uh, takes Alexander King's hand, uh, then the, the junior Alexander or the young Alexander. Uh, he sees his palm and says that uh, you can't be a great king. Um, so Alexander is pretty innocent. He asks why. He say, uh, the priest says that there is one of the lines is missing. And he says, this line, if you had crossed this particular line, you would have been a great king. Um, and Alexander runs away. So probably everybody thinks that, okay, Alexander is crying or whatever. But he comes back in a few minutes, and he would have uh, taken a small uh, dagger, and he would have drawn a line. And he would come back to the priest and say that, can I be a great king now? So I think uh, if you believe in it, uh, you can really uh, do what, what you want to do. So it doesn't matter what the world tells, uh, whether you have the pedigree, you don't have the pedigree in you. I think if we really believe in the model and we go after it, uh, being logically uh, 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 not very stupid on why we are doing what we are doing. If, if you have got the self-belief, I think uh, anyone can pull off. Alexander Great is a great example. And today, uh, uh, I think uh, we, uh, in our firm, we can, as, as in our company, as non-tech founders, we can still say that non-tech companies can still be funded. We have raised about $200 million in the last 18 months. So uh, uh, that's a great example. So that uh, anyone can actually go ahead, build businesses, not worry about being an engineer or anything of that sort, right? And the solution that we have built is totally uh, tech-driven. Uh, the kind of IoT talent that we were able to hire and the solution we were able to imagine, I keep telling my uh, team that because I'm not an engineer, I can, I can think big, right? As in, I don't have any boundaries. If I was an engineer, I would have probably said that it's not possible, why it is not possible. I think the not being an engineer really helped because I could just say that, okay, this is how we want it and the engineers had to now figure it out. So I think uh, there are definitely benefits of not being an engineer and still work on a tech startup. It has played out really well for us. Uh, no boundaries in terms of imagination because we don't know how it works. So uh, that has really played out. And uh, we all know about Vishweshwaraya. It doesn't matter where you come from, whether people have done it before or not. Uh, Saram B is, is one of the biggest engineers uh, uh, in the world, has gone through a lot of hardships to everything. So these are three stories which uh, we all keep in mind when we are doing whatever we are doing. Um, I think the timer is up. Uh, I'll quickly. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, uh, see, what we, what we have seen is that uh, uh, we actually uh, get a lot of support from Hyderabad police and Bangalore traffic police. So now we have built tech. So if you see what is the problem for the traffic police, uh, what used to happen uh, if you ride a scooter without a helmet, earlier they could take the key off and get the penalty, right? Here people can just leave the scooter and walk away. Uh, police, what they used to be really frustrated about was, we want to hold these guys responsible. So what we started doing, uh, doing was in our app, you have to upload your driving license, and we know who the person who is riding it. Now we have started sharing this data with the traffic police. Uh, we have actually made, it, made the work real time where we can, earlier the penalties were only on the vehicle number, right? Now we can actually put the liability on the driving license. So that this driving license, now we have gone to an extent where Hyderabad, we can cancel the driving license if someone violates three times or four times. So we have started working with the department pretty well. Uh, a lot of data sharing which is happening. We have also uh, started doing a lot of behavior shaping because today we know what people do when nobody is watching. So everyone is disciplined when someone is watching, right? When we give you a scooter, give a person a scooter which, and ask him to uh, just ride and no one is watching, we know the user's real behavior. So like a financial score, we are building a credit score, uh, which is around behavior. You can call it a karma score or whatever. This will be shared with fintech, uh, financial agencies, saying that this shows the intent of repayment, right? So we give a helmet without any chain attached to it, and if you don't keep the helmet back, we know that if, if nobody is watching you, probably you don't have an intent to repay, uh, pay back, right? 
So this is a critical data point that we're sitting on. Um, a lot of data points are on how you write to everything. Now we have started monetizing that by giving this to uh, financial agencies. So this problem became a big data point for us. Uh, but we have to keep innovating. People keep trying to beat the solution. Uh, the idea is that we have to keep doing what we are doing because mobility has to be seen as fundamental, right? And millions of them. I still remember how I used to go to my article ship and I used to go to my tuitions to everything. Uh, a vehicle which a friend of mine gave really made me what I am today. So I know the importance of mobility. Millions of them today don't have access to mobility. And I think this is the most logical way of providing public transport. So we call this alternate public transport. The cost of solution is very low. There is no driver uh, on the solution. People can ride it themselves. So I think it's very stupid for people to own their own two-wheeler when they can just pay for the time and distance they use it. So that is what, that's what keeps us going. Thank you so much. There's Thank a lot more to share. I'll, I'll talk with you uh, individually. Yeah, thanks.